Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 100, February 13th to February 19th, 1863. Last week, we had a lighter episode, but we did manage to check in on the situation along the Mississippi River. We had operations by the Union Navy to blockade the Red River, and also mentioned the formidable fortifications at Port Hudson. We had a brief rundown of some of the world events that we missed in 1862 as well. This week, we'll actually return to a world event with the French intervention into Mexico. But first, we have two smaller scale events we need to mention. First, let's head to Arkansas. Before we do that, though, just want to mention that the Patreon episode for this month, this uh, month of February here, it is posted, should be posted here by the time of the recording. That's going to be the memoirs of Rufus Dawes. Dawes is going to serve in the 6th Wisconsin, the Iron Brigade. So he's giving us a good insight into what that was like and some of the engagements that have already happened and then some of the engagements that, that will happen, right? Gettysburg being uh, one of the big ones for the Iron Brigade, and then they continue to serve in the Eastern Theater. So there are some pretty interesting things that uh, I like to point out with that memoir review. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, there is a link to the Patreon in the show description. And of course, the proceeds of that would go to the general upkeep of the show, and it is greatly appreciated. On February 15th, we had the skirmish at McGraw's Mill. By February of 1863, there were enough bands of Unionists, deserters, and otherwise individuals in the South who were not trying to be conscripted into the rebel army. There was a large sentiment in Arkansas, some of these men eventually actually forming the 1st Arkansas U.S. Cavalry. The 1st Arkansas would be especially adept as counter guerrilla troops, and we're going to talk about those here in a future episode and what roles they play moving forward. We've already been at least briefly introduced to them in the Prairie Grove campaign. They serve there, uh, and they're attacked by uh, Joseph Shelby's cavalry, and we, we kind of talked about that when we were going over the actions of that battle, that campaign. But one particular band of Unionist sympathizers were led by a Captain Brown near a place called Arkadelphia. Now we're going to talk actually next week about guerrilla activity and irregular warfare in general. So this skirmish is in many ways a good preview of what we're going to talk about. Irregular warfare was not exclusively a Confederate tactic, which I think we will highlight well next week. Captain Brown and his men would take from the local civilians in order to be supplied. This obviously did not sit well with the Confederate Home Guard. Home Guard units from surrounding counties would converge on the Unionists and their camp. Captain Brown would form his men on high ground, conducive to defense, enforcing the Confederates to dismount, as well as decrease combat effectiveness by having either a fourth man hold the mounts. We've talked before about how that's a common role that the cavalrymen would play. They would dismount and someone has to hold the horses, so that's reducing the number of guns they can bring to a firing line. Home Guard units still outnumbered the Unionists and forced their enemy to withdraw after a sharp fight. The Confederates suffered six casualties compared to 11 killed, 24 wounded, an additional 20 captured. While not really having the greatest of significance, the action at McGraw's Mill is a good example of the type of action that has been popping up and will continue to pop up all over the South. It is also a good example of the discontent that is going to start to boil over with more and more people becoming dissatisfied with how the war is going. Also in February, 
Between the 17th and 18th, we have the Cherokee meeting at Cowskin Prairie in Oklahoma to hold a council. Now, it has been a while since we talked about the war in Oklahoma, but remember, there were divided sides amongst the so-called civilized tribes for support for the Union or the Confederacy. There had been a treaty signed with the Confederate government supported by slaveholding individuals. Several engagements had been fought between the two sides, some of which we have already discussed in previous episodes. John Ross will be in Washington advocating for the Cherokee. Now, John Ross is actually a member of the Cherokee tribe, and he he's going to be the primary opposition to the pro-Confederate faction. We've heard of Stan Wati and, and his actions already and his service so far, and he's going to continue to be pro-Confederate throughout the remainder of the war. He's the last general to actually surrender on the Confederate side. Uh, he's the only Native American general that serves during the war on either side, and uh, he's going to be the primary leader for this pro-Confederate side, uh, especially as the war dwindles down. But just keep in mind, John Ross, he's a, more of a politician, so he's going to be in Washington servicing his people in that way. At Cowskin Prairie, mostly pro-Union Cherokee would gather and discuss future steps. These would include attempting to align more closely with the Union cause should the war continue to progress away from the fortunes of the Confederacy. It was decided by the Council that the slaves in Indian Territory would be emancipated. We have some of the verbiage here. Be it enacted by the National Council that in view of the difficulties and evils which have arisen from the institution of slavery and which seem inseparable from its existence in the Cherokee Nation. The delegation appointed to proceed to Washington are empowered and instructed to assure the President of the United States of the desire of the authorities and people to remove that institution from the statures and soil of the Cherokee Nation, and of their wish to provide for that object at once upon the principle of compensation to the owners of slaves not disloyal to the government of the United States, as tendered by Congress to states which shall abolish slavery to their midst. And in case the government of the United States accede to this proposition, the said delegation are hereby authorized and instructed to enter into an agreement with the government for the immediate emancipation of all slaves in the Cherokee Nation, and African slavery shall therefore be abolished and forever cease to exist in said nation. And therefore, it shall be unlawful for any person to hold a slave within the limits of the Cherokee Nation. And any person who before any of the courts of the nation, having jurisdiction in the case, shall be found guilty of holding a slave or slaves, shall be fined in a sum not less than $1,000, nor more than $5,000. And so any slave so held in bondage shall be forever free. Now, this does not affect the pro-Union faction as much because they were less likely to have slaves in the first place, right? The two sides would actually be at odds even after the conclusion of the Civil War, not signing a treaty until 1866. There would be continued debate over the fate of the freedmen within the nation, and this debate, unfortunately, would be going well past the end of the Civil War. Now, the other thing I do want to point out here is that this proclamation, shall we say here, it uh, sort of gives the same deal that the federal government is giving across the slaveholding states that they occupy, right? Um, it has been the goal of the Lincoln administration so far not to alienate these individuals, and being heavy-handed is not necessarily going to be the best way to do that, right? Um, so they are offering compensation in lieu of having slaves. It's not the same deal that necessarily the rest of the Confederacy is going to get, 
Um, but it is interesting to kind of point this out. And it's something that maybe we don't necessarily realize if we're um, just taking what we learn maybe in school that, and that's usually the narrative is that the war is about slavery and, and that's it. There's, there's nothing really to, to talk about anymore about that. Uh, right. But, um, it kind of evolves throughout the war. Um, if the war had ended in 1862, things might've been different. And obviously we kind of see this progression as, as we move forward here and becomes a little bit more hard line when, the Lincoln administration and the federal government realized that they're really going to need to take shots at the Confederate ability to make war. And we've, we've talked about that in previous episodes. So let's just keep that in mind as we move forward. So we talked about the French intervention into Mexico during our events of 1862 segment. I would like to get a little bit more in depth with that event because it has a direct correlation with events in the United States. You could say actually that the Mexican-American War was partially responsible for the French showing up once again in the Americas. Remember that Mexico is able to gain independence from Spain partially because of the collapse of Spain following the occupation by the French during the Napoleonic Wars. If you're a student of the Napoleonic era, you know that Napoleon installs his brother, to be the new king of Spain. So it is not something that works out for him in the long run. And actually, it's also interesting that there is a lot of guerrilla activity. There's a lot of irregular warfare that's involved uh, with that occupation. So um, definitely is going to connect in to some of the things we already talked about and certainly going to connect into our episode next week when we talk about uh, the guerrilla conflict during the Civil War. We talked about the Texas War of Independence and then the Mexican-American War in previous episodes. We also talked about the concept of Manifest Destiny. As you can imagine, a foreign occupying army moving into Mexico City, outnumbered, and then forcing a large swath of territory away as a condition of the surrender was embarrassing to the Mexican people. There was a legit fear that the Americans would take away more land in Central America and use it for slaveholding purposes. Remember that James K. Polk, a.k.a. Little Hickory, was planning just such a move. Well, the 1860s are not that far removed from Winfield Scott capturing Mexico City, so there's still a concern that the Americans will come back and finish what they started. It's not like Manifest Destiny has necessarily gone away either. So there are some in Mexico who think that foreign monarchy is the way to go. This is coming from a more conservative angle. While there is a liberal faction as well in Mexico, if you remember Benito Juarez leading them, and we talked about that in one of our other World Events episodes. These two sides would fight in a civil war, and it is going to be wrapped up a little prior to the outbreak of the American Civil War. But there are still these talks of foreign intervention, and Louis Napoleon is going to help provide an answer. Napoleon III, remember, is interested in re-establishing an empire, and it could be Asia, it could be Africa, and it could also be America. It could be every single one of those places, right? Ideally. Now his occupation of Algeria is not going well, much like Haiti did not go well for his uncle, so I personally question of the judgment of getting into another 1800s Vietnam. But there is an interesting opportunity. Since the Monroe Doctrine, obviously the United States have not been cool with foreign powers showing up into their hemisphere. But America is sort of busy at the moment and will otherwise be occupied, so that France has a nice little window. Additionally, remember that getting into bed with the Confederacy was frowned upon unless there is some kind of support from other powers, like, say, England. Well, I believe also that part of the world update from 1861 involved the absolving of foreign debt. This is a great concept, unless you, say, are a foreign power, and you're owed money, like France and England. England is also irritated by the Mexican liberals stealing money as well. <laughs> 
so there's going to be no opposition if the French move in. Like I said, a golden opportunity. But the question was, who was going to lead this new country? It would not be Napoleon III, but rather a client-like state that could be controlled from Paris. France was a big advocate for the separation from American influence. In fact, this is where the term Latin America comes from. This was a phrase used widely in France as well as the Americas to unite against the culturally different Americans. So there needed to be a monarch with a pedigree that would seemingly be accepted by the Mexican people. Maximilian of Austria, the younger brother of the Emperor of Austria, was selected for this task. While he was a more liberal-thinking individual, he was also a Habsburg, and definitely enamored with bringing back the glory of the Habsburgs, once the most powerful family in the world. Maximilian was very receptive to the idea of becoming the new emperor of Mexico, and he started to plan out the way in which he would govern, using ideas he had attempted to put into place while governing Italy, which had seen large amounts of insurgency, we should say. Here were the main problems, though. Support for a foreign ruler was going to be lukewarm in Mexico. In fact, the kind of individuals who would rally to the flag were not as savory. One counter-revolutionary was nicknamed the Butcher for his execution of waristas. Secondly, Britain was not really gung-ho about the idea, and British naval support had been a stipulation of the agreement. Napoleon solved this problem by simply not telling Maximilian, so problem solved, and the venture was put forward. Something else I do want to mention as well is that a lot of the individuals who are kind of stoking the flames of this, who are from Mexico, um, they have not been in Mexico. So that's another interesting thing that I, when researching, I, I came across that these individuals were still living in Europe because obviously they weren't welcome under uh, Juarez and his government. So they're not really in touch with things that are going on, but they're kind of, uh, like I said, stoking the flames and blowing smoke and making sure that it, make, it makes sense to these Europeans who should also probably be said were, were ignorant of what was going on in Mexico anyway. Uh, so it's going to be spun in a way in which this is all going to seem like one great idea. A French expeditionary force supported by smaller amounts of Spanish and British forces would land in Veracruz. They would get bogged down there and immediately start adding men to the sick list in the unfamiliar country. Reinforcements would have to be sent from France, but in total the expeditionary force would only be some 6,000 men. Not a very large army at all. It's actually going to be far less, right? We talked about in the Mexican-American War, Winfield Scott has 12,000 men. Um, and while that's not particularly a large army, and certainly the Mexicans could come up with more men than that, you know, 6,000 is, is just not going to cut it. A plan was hatched to pick a fight with the Juarez government and then declare war. Rather than pick a fight, though, the leaders of the expedition actually signed documents recognizing the Mexican government. So that is definitely not part of the plan. They weren't supposed to do that. And there's obviously there's a big problem with recognizing this as an official government. It's going to seem like this super hostile action. Remember, we have all these rules, and we talked about this more in terms of uh, naval episodes, but there are all these rules in terms of uh, what you can and can't do. And uh, obviously recognizing the government, that's a big no-no. That was very high up there on the do not do list, right? So the 6,000 men would advance to the town of Puebla, which is on the way to Mexico City. Puebla was fortified and defended by 12,000 Mexicans. Regardless, the French decided for a frontal assault. Well-placed artillery would repulse the attackers at the cost of some 476 casualties, a large number considering the small force. This victory at the First Battle of Puebla in 1862 is celebrated as Cinco de Mayo. In 
Now, this was problematic for many reasons, most notably the French army having a reputation as being the best army in the world. Remember how many of the officers in the Civil War would wish to mimic them. They had helped to win the Crimean War, and most recently had success in Italy. Napoleon III would commit more troops, and in 1863, the French army would return this time with 26,000 men. A siege would result in the capture of the town, and then the subsequent capture of Mexico City. President Juarez would disperse into the north. The French military would combine with imperialist Mexican forces in an effort to root out Juarez, campaigning into the fringes of the country. In fact, they would come into contact with Confederates at Brownsville, Texas, as part of their hunt for Juarez, whose Juaristas reverted to a regular guerrilla warfare. But despite the capture of Mexico City, problems would start immediately. The clergy would clash with the French army, there being a definite divide between the conservative church and the more, at least more liberal approaches to the French. You know, remember they had some revolutions there, right? So they're not quite so conservative anymore. An example would be that the church would fine individuals who would work on Sunday without going to mass and without getting the permission from a priest. So as you can imagine, very sounds almost medieval, right, in the way they're handling that. But despite not everything being sunshine and roses in Mexico, the emperor was on his way, following a kerfuffle with his brother where he renounced his claims to the Austrian throne, something that was deeply embarrassing to his goals of restoring the Habsburg dynasty. Maximilian would arrive in 1864 and take over his new empire, following the gathering of support by central Mexico. He would start to apply liberal reform and had generally good ideas, attempting to assimilate himself more into Mexican culture. But, and this is a big problem, Maximilian was not really interested in really ruling, him being more of an idea guy. Edicts went unenforced, and the emperor occupied himself with unimportant things, including building palaces for himself and his wife, the empress Carlotta. Too much time went into touring the country, and too little went to spending time in the capital. Imperialists from the army were changing sides, especially when faced with atrocities committed by the French, an imperial army attempting to quell the counterinsurgency. To be fair, there were definite atrocities and no quarter given by both rebels and the imperialists, something that rivals the war in Missouri, which, once again, we're going to talk about next week. Eventually, the bell would toll for French involvement in Mexico. The venture was costing too much in terms of French lives and money, especially when compared to an ungrateful Maximilian. The United States also had a role to play. By 1865, the war was over, and it just so happened that America now had the largest military that was well-trained following the war. Grant would turn to John Schofield to start putting together an army to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the French. Schofield would actually go to Paris and confer with Napoleon, giving a speech in which he mentioned how America commanded the largest navy and army, which was not so subtle a hint that they were going to be prepared to defend the Monroe Doctrine. So while there was this golden window, the window was now shut. Napoleon III would decide to end the French intervention, leaving the country to Maximilian, his Austrian legions, and the imperialists. America, while not directly involved, was giving weapons and supplies to Juaristas. Former soldiers from the war would join into the conflict, and most, oddly enough, sided with Juarez. There was even an American Legion of Honor that fought in the final campaign against Maximilian. Fontaine Murray would actually be a part of Maximilian's court, the emperor wishing to capitalize on former confederates for his army. The American government continued even further with their own form of intervention, arresting a potential rival to Juarez from returning to Mexico, 
this division amongst the Republican ranks might have made things better for Maximilian. Now, you might be wondering, you know, why why would the United States do this? Um, it, it is a fair question, uh, but just remember that the MO of the United States is always to not have a large presence with foreign powers into this hemisphere. So it is always going to be a problem when there's a French puppet state on your border, directly on your border. That's a direct threat, right? Think about Manifest Destiny and how America is sort of going to be leading the way in terms of uh, the Americas in general, right? And how some of this land might be reserved for the United States. And then on an even more base level, we should also point out that Napoleon III and the French were siding with the Confederacy. So they were almost directly involved with dividing up the country. So obviously you got guys like Grant and Schofield who fought for the Union Army and uh, you, all the other Union veterans who are probably not satisfied with the French at all. So there's all these factors that are going into the United States poking their nose and being involved in the conflict. Things would continue to get worse for Max. Despite delays in the potential withdrawal of French troops, there was no more backing from Napoleon III in a monetary sense. Imperialists went unpaid, and in 1866 the situation was so dire that Empress Carlotta traveled to Europe to plead the case of the Mexican Empire. Meanwhile, Maximilian pondered abdication and came very close to doing just that, but for conservatives convincing him otherwise. The emperor would go back on his decision when faced with French pressure to abdicate, despite the French officers informing Maximilian that they would not be able to resist the gathering number of Republicans under Juarez. His hatred of Napoleon III would continue all the way until his death. I'll point out, too, that you kind of feel for Maximilian, right? He gets caught up in this scheme to place himself as being an emperor and he gets all these promises from the French and it's not even his idea, right? It's not like he came up with it, but the French are backing him to pulling the third. It's like, I got you. I, you know, I, I got your back here. And then all of a sudden he doesn't. And it, it is also interesting on the flip side of that, that um, things went fairly well for his early reign. And if there had just been a tighter control if there had just been more pressure applied uh, to try to bring Juarez in, or maybe even uh, certain decisions go the other way, it's always this kind of what-if battle with history, right? But I think there's enough of a positive when he first came in where things could have turned out very differently if there had just been different decisions made. So it's just interesting to think about. The French soldiers and many of the foreign volunteers would go back to Europe, leaving the imperialist Mexicans and a small number of Europeans to square off against three different armies. After campaigning personally, Maximilian and a majority of his supporters were trapped, resulting in a siege. Breakout attempts would be unsuccessful, eventually leading to a betrayal where Republicans would enter the town. The emperor was captured, Mexico soon falling under overall Horista control. There were actually several escape plans for the emperor, but Maximilian was as indecisive at saving his life as he was with ruling the country. As a result, he would be executed in 1867. But here we can ask what the significance was compared with our story. The Civil War was the reason the French felt that the time was right for intervention, but it was really the last true challenge to the Monroe Doctrine from Europe. Reunited, America would start to emerge as the power and expand with imperialistic fervor, with their own interventions and occupations into Latin America. And that could be something that we talk about maybe once our narrative has concluded, we can get more into that. It's probably something that not very many people know about. But, as I always say, stay tuned for that. So there we have a brief explanation of the French intervention so we can go ahead and stop there. We may mention events as they affect our story moving forward. We had a skirmish in Arkansas at McGraw's Mill and the Cowskin Prairie Council in Oklahoma. Next week, we will spend all of the time talking a little bit more in depth about guerrilla activity 
during the Civil War. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. I post visuals onto the website. The website's also in the show description, and uh, there's some maps and pictures and things that I've been posting on there. There's also a mobile app that you can download through Wix, which might make things a little bit easier uh, with viewing those. So make sure to check that out as well. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.